certain website. Okay, there we go. So if anybody wants to stay in, you're uh, consenting to be recorded. And thank you. All right, I'll give it one more minute and see if Melanie does come up. We never know. I've done enough of these Zooms to know at five, usually someone does pop in right at like, oh, yes, I had a meeting. So we'll give it just uh, one more minute. But uh, for those that are entering, uh, we have to my left, is, which is my right, is Betty Meltzer. And this is Supuan Bowden. I'm Francisco Ramos, the historian of the Banning Library District. And then off center, our man of the hour is David James Heiss, uh, the illustrious reporter for the Record Gazette newspaper. So, well, with that said, we might as well get started. So if anybody has questions, uh, we'll go to save that to the very end if we have time. Uh, you can always post them in the chat. And if our guests are willing to do so, they can answer them on their own after. And we can send you an email response in case we don't get to it. Uh, I'm Francisco Ramos. I'm the historian for the Bang Library District. I'm very happy to have the, the pleasure of interviewing these three wonderful people I've come to work with and be a part of the community with in the last several years. Uh, this is our first oral history Zoom celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And as such, uh, Kevin Lee, our uh, district director, would like to share some words. He couldn't be here today, uh, but he wanted to kick off our celebration and commemorate the event as well. So this is from our director, Kevin Lee, and for those that may not know, he's of Korean heritage. Kevin would like to say that the Banning Library District celebrates the rich culture, contributions, and achievements of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders during National Asian Pacific American Heritage Month throughout the month of May. And quote, this came from the um, Asian Pacific Heritage site, which is a governmental website uh, through the Library of Congress. It says the month of May was chosen to commemorate the immigration of the first Japanese American to the United States on May 7th, 1843 and to mark the anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869. Majority of the workers who laid the tracks for that railroad were Chinese immigrants. And so as such, uh, he wishes us well and that we have a very good oral history session today. And thank you for our participants for participating today uh, as well. Um, I would like to mention as we start off that uh, we are doing these oral history sessions to uh, bring the community together and also to highlight that there are so many people that often get unsung in oral history because they're not usually noted or mentioned. And so, as I mentioned in our COVID Zoom we had a few weeks ago, uh, this program tries to serve in broadcasting some of our uh, more dedicated and diehard community citizens that give so much to our community and make it a wonderful place to be, the San Gregorio Pass. And we want to celebrate that history and also celebrate the heritage because this is AAPI Heritage Month. So as such, I invited several groups to be a part of our Zoom today, but we couldn't get everyone together because of schedules or conflicting uh, interests. So that was unfortunate, but I'm very glad that we have the participation of our three guests physically here in Beaumont. And then we also asked uh, our board member, Melanie Lara, to be part, and uh, maybe she'll be in later. And uh, if we do get her presence, she will also contribute as well. But to kick off our uh, oral history project today, I just want to give a little background. Uh, we have one book at the library, and I've mentioned this before to folks that may have met me in person and our last COVID Zoom. This book was written by a historian named Hughes, and he was paid by the city of Banning in the late 30s to do a kind of oral history project, but on paper regarding some of the founders that were Anglos and are also Native Americans and take down their memories as to what it was like to be a part of the Banning and the San Antonio Pass community in the turn of the 18th century into the 19th century and up until uh, the 30s. And it's uh, sometimes random and there's little tidbits here and there about certain folks. But one of the things that I found notable is that uh, Asian Americans have been a part of our community since as early as that book has its oldest memory, which is uh, the early 1900s. It mentions Chinese immigrants that came to help build the railroad through here in the past. What's unfortunate is it does not go into greater depth. We don't actually get the names of those folks that were monumental in creating the Transcontinental Railroad, our railroad here through the past, and other infrastructure projects in the United States at that time. And sadly, that is a historic trend that the uh, contributions of so many folks from uh, Asian, uh, Asia, uh, America, Asia proper, and also the Pacific Islander nations were not always appreciated, were treated very poorly, 
and we're not giving the proper due respect for their contributions to our country that they have uh, contributed to. Uh, part of my studies at UC Riverside was in uh, looking up the history of some of the early cattle farms in the 1850s up until the uh, early 1900s through a German and an Irish immigrant named Miller and Lux. And they had many hundreds of people that were of Asian descent work for them, and they often gave them different names, unfortunately, that were anglicized or that were completely removing their own cultural heritage uh, as employees of their cattle uh, farms throughout our state. So it's a trend, it's a sad trend. It's something that in history we need to recognize so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I'm happy today to highlight three wonderful people that have given so much to our community. So with that, we're gonna start. Um, I will introduce our first guest and uh, guest speaker and have her introduce part of her heritage, which is Betty. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Hey, my name is Betty. And I actually the year, but it must have been about 1890s or so when the big sugar companies were looking for workers from the Far East, Japan, China, Philippines, etc. Uh, Francisco? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Betty's introduction toned out. Can she just repeat that part for, I guess, the uh, recording? Sure, could you uh, maybe speak a little louder? My name is Betty Meltzer, and I worked at Banning High School as a librarian and English teacher for about 30 years. And now I'm retired and living in Beaumont area. Now I was never, cognizant of this area, although I had gone through the University of Redlands, but after we got to the point where we came back from New York, where we had gone because my husband is a watercolorist, an art major, and we looked around and he decided he needed a house which had a studio-like area to it. So we found, or he found a place in Cherry Valley and we've been living here ever since. He has since passed away. We have two children. My son Abraham is a federal attorney. My daughter works for, uh, worked for the United States government for a while and worked in the patent office for a long time and represented our country in the Far East where she received a gold medal from the uh, Department of Commerce for some of the work she did. And right now what I'm doing in retirement is trying to clean my house, <laughs> get to the basement and get all the important papers, documents and letters from some interesting persons and passed them on to my family. <clears throat> it's working very slowly because I'm old and number two. As a librarian, very often I get um, stuck in reading things that I run into. And before I know it, an hour is gone and you know, it's time for bed. All right, thank you. Uh, Supon? Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hmm. My bio, huh? Okay, I was born in the Kokonom in northeast of Thailand. And um, my the oldest of the seven children, my both my parents were teachers. Um, I went to elementary school, elementary school, secondary school, and then went to the preparation tourist school in Bangkok. Went to university. Graduate, did not pass the bar, if you will. <laughs> um, uh, so I went home you know, to cry myself to tear or something, feel sorry for myself. So my mom sent me to get a job at the governor's mansion, the go go governor's office. They wanted somebody to help with the secretary of something to looking for a person who can do tax, tax collection of, of the local tax collection. And 
and I was qualified because I got a law degree. So just that. And so I went to work. The first very work, the first time I ever get a job that I pay, everyone. And I got married, had a child, and came to this country. I think that's uh, just wrap it up. That's it. That's my life so far. Very good. And off to my left is uh, David James Nice. And actually, we're going to talk about his question and we're going to show you a presentation too. So uh, let's switch places and I'll turn on the slideshow. Okay. He is real. He's here. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to uh, bear with us for a second. I'm going to show a presentation that he's compiled of his heritage and his trip to Vietnam a few years ago. Uh, Fernando, if you could just allow me to screen share, that would be good. All right, give me a second here. Let's see here. Just say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. I could share my screen. That's gonna have to be mine unfortunately yeah to make I'm, I'm wondering if i need to make you the host yes okay cool making you the host okay, nope. i don't know if that's gonna do anything with the recording but here you go oh got it perfect thank you okay so we are now going to screen share and i'm going to show your presentation all right, here we go. So as that's being set up, my name is David Heiss and I was, I'm told I was born in uh, Saigon, which was, which is now Ho Chi Minh City. And I was adopted by an Irish German family um, and came over here in 1974. I grew up in New England, came out to California to attend the University of Redlands and I've been out here ever since. Um, what I wanted to share with you is, is a brief watered down presentation that I like to give to service clubs. The, if you guys ever want that presentation, it's about 40 minutes long. This is only a few minutes and it's uh, sublimated from what we normally would have. So I'm not sure what they're seeing. Oh, you're just gonna click each slide on the okay. side. All right, so, so Jack Vernon, who is also um, watching this, uh, sponsored a trip to Vietnam 10 years ago, uh, as of March. And we were uh, tasked with teaching English at a private school for a couple of weeks through Global Volunteers, which is a nonprofit. And we, uh, this is just a really brief tour of Vietnam and some of the experiences that we had. So that so I don't know a lot about my history and my heritage in Vietnam since I grew up in an American household. I don't speak the language. Um, and so the, the opportunity to go back to Vietnam at the age of 39 and see what it, what it was like. We, we were teaching in Hanoi, which is far, far north compared to where I was born in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, when you get to uh, Hanoi, which is the capital, there are just miles and miles of street, um, I'm sorry, miles and miles of uh, storefronts and literally they go on and on and on. And we were told that um, one of our tour guides explained that they're, they're taxed based on the, the square footage on the ground. So instead of expanding outwards, they expand upwards. So as you can see from here, excuse me. This is our team, uh, Jack is in the middle. Um, and I, uh, the Vietnamese dong is not, um, a, a thousand dong is worth about five cents. So 200,000 dong was closer to uh, five bucks. And some of the, some of their currency uh, is inspired by uh, geographical features such as Halong Bay. I stood at a street corner, just kind of stood in the middle and, and did a 180 degree turn uh, to give you a, an idea of what I was seeing. To walk around in a, in a street, um, in, Hon in Hanoi anyway, you have to kind of walk on the side of the sidewalk because uh, everyone rides these little motorbikes and they all park on the sidewalk. 
and so there's not a lot of room. In America, when we beep at someone, it's because we're annoyed with them or we're trying to say hi. Usually they honk at you because they're coming up from behind you to let you know, don't walk further into the street because I'm coming up behind you. I was just uh, fascinated by the fact that there were two stores in a row and this is all they sold was scissors and shears. <laughs> um, to walk across a busy street in Hanoi, you just have to walk across the street. There aren't a lot of traffic lights and so um, if you're not used to it it's a daunting you know they're all coming at you about 20 miles an hour and they'll either go around you or they'll slow down and let you go by so this is me trying to take a, a hurried picture as i cross the street um, this is typical traffic situation all these bikes are trying to negotiate that u-turn in there um, there's not a lot of room for for cars uh, an ambulance that passed us no one pulls over for it and it's got its lights flashing, but it had to go with the flow of the traffic. This is the hostel that we stayed at, the team stayed at, uh, day and night picture. Um, it's the capital, so there are, these are embassies. I couldn't tell you what all uh, countries they were. Um, some of them are evident. The only one that had armed guards was is Israel's. We were told not to eat food on the side of the street because our constitutions probably would not be able to handle the fact that they just kind of chop it up in front of you and then they hose off the, uh, the cutlery and the plates and prepare for the next client. Uh, there was a lot of construction going on in Hanoi all over the city. This is the entrance to the private school that we, we taught at for two weeks. And they were, they were also adding to that. Um, there was another floor being added all around that courtyard. Uh, we taught, I think, kindergarten through fifth grade. And what we learned, what I discovered is that kids in, at least at a private school in Vietnam, are no different than kids in America. They're just as rambunctious and they play with each other's pencils and so forth. And this teacher is slamming a couple of wooden sticks, which startled the heck out of me when she did it. It didn't phase the kids one bit. I just thought it was interesting that he drew an American tank. Um, they have siesta, which uh, right oh. after lunch, they have, they have an hour long siesta. Uh, the upper grades apparently are separated differently, but all the kids, this is when during a break, the teacher's trying to do her grading or something, but normally that is where the kids will have their siesta. This is part of our team, uh, Jack Brennan down there on the left. Kui was the principal of the school. Um, the significant reason why I put this picture in here is the lower photo at lunchtime, um, every classroom has all of its, uh, all of its food and dishware and, and uh, everything's delivered to each classroom. Whereas the staff um, got to eat in the basement which wasn't that bad. And the food is pretty good, uh, but compared, and if you think about it, it's just like school food anywhere. After a few days, you get the same stuff over and over and it's no longer as exciting. <laughs> there are a dozen colleges around Hanoi and this was a college fair for the upper grades in their courtyard. Uh, I discovered that kids seem to respond better to theatrics uh, than just a standard lecture. I think we were, I, I'm imitating myself being on a beach we, that was one of voc vocab words of speech, I guess, and the kids seemed to respond to that. We went to a university where Confucius taught. Um, these are stele, stele uh, with the names of all of the early graduates uh, inscribed on all of these tablets, basically. And they're on the backs of tortoises. Tortoises, dragons, and elephants are the symbols um, that are used in Vietnamese mythology. Uh, the, the, their belief is that evil spirits can't go over um, high surfaces, so this, this is a small ledge to prevent evil spirits from getting into the university. I thought it was interesting that um, graveyards just can pop up anywhere. This is a rice paddy surrounded, well, yeah, surrounding a um, cemetery. At the top, you can see this is a, an example of someone who had resources to bury their family, and then at the bottom, uh, someone who would, did not. We got to sample lots of food. This is Americanized. Um, 
the Vietnamese, uh, at least in other cultures, they don't have a lot of sugar in their diets or they don't serve sweets like we do here. This is tapioca root, which has the consistency of a baked potato and probably not much more taste than that. And mm -hmm. they gave us peanut, crushed peanuts there in the center to, to dip it into to check out. And those are um, little uh, cups of tea. And this is jackfruit. I don't know how to describe how it tastes other than it, I was repulsed by it and I didn't like it. I wouldn't recommend it, but um, they seem to like it. Uh, during a cruise, we passed a few vendors like this. Um, they raise up a net to take your money and then um, they send it back up with whatever it is that you wanted to, to buy. And the cruise ships are pretty good about cooking whatever it is you wanted uh, to add to your meal at your table. This is a bomb crater. Um, we, we went down to visit uh, the Coochie Tunnels, which is actually down near Ho Chi Minh. Uh, we did that one weekend. And um, I guess out here, it would be the size of the Replier Park Bowl. That is the size of all of that right there, where that crater is. Uh, this is a diagram of the tunnels, uh, the Viet Cong tunnels. Now, it's not exactly what they look like because they're not mapped but it's to give you an idea of uh, the upper layers where you, where you could actually stand up um, is for officers. And then you have a few uh, dips um, that if you don't know, don't know where you're going and you fall into some sharpened uh, sticks uh, that are poisoned, you're probably gonna be stuck there for all eternity. And these are some of the traps that American soldiers were uh, encountering when they were out in the, in the jungle. You can, for a fee, fire off weapons that uh, they used during the Vietnam War. And they're, they're loud and they can startle you because it comes out from the jungle. And when you think of the word jungle, basically where you saw that bamboo, uh, that all of the, it, it's not like rainforest, it's just dense undergrowth. And these are some of the critters you can find out in the jungle. Um, they have created the Coochie tunnels. They have created uh, tunnels that you could theoretically walk through. Um, the tunnels that the Viet Cong used were not tunnels that you could walk through, but so the foreigners could have an idea of what it's like to be walking through these. Um, the deeper the tunnels went, the warmer it got. The actual tunnels, most of them are covered up and uh, you can peel them back and look in them. No one would actually stop you from going in those tunnels, they're about the size of, um, if you think about the space under your chair, that's about how, how big they are if you were to crawl through them. And again, they're dark, they're not mapped, they have trap falls, uh, pitfalls, sorry. And if you ever went exploring on your own, um, no one's coming after you if you get lost. This is an example of a hole that was made by bamboo to provide air into a, a tunnel. If your waist size is 40 or above, you probably won't be able to fit into the tunnels, but they, they give you the opportunity to um, cover yourself up and see what it's like to be in one. Um, down in Ho Chi Minh, we also got to visit the presidential palace. This is uh, a rebuild. Sorry, it's not the original. I think the, the original was destroyed by the French. And these are just some of the pictures from inside that building from back in the day. We also visited the War Museum and their War Museum depicts all the atrocities that Amer uh, Americans did to the Vietnamese because that is their museum. And these are some of the um, birth defects that come from uh, Agent Orange. And some of the pictures I didn't show in here are, they, they show the atrocities of what grenades do to Vietnamese victims. And I just wanted to conclude that what I, what I discovered about my life, um, thanks to Jack Brennan, who requested me to give him my old um, passport from 1974, because I obviously can't use it anymore. Uh, I didn't know he brought it with him to Vietnam. And he struck up a conversation with the general manager of the hostel we were staying at. Mind you, we were in Hanoi. And I would say that Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh are as far away as San Francisco and LA are from each other. And they, this, this manager called someone down in Ho, in Ho Chi Minh City, um, tracked down somebody that apparently lived at, uh, worked at the orphanage that I came from, 
and uh, offered to try and have you talk to him, but the, the guy couldn't speak English. And in the 20 minutes that they were on the phone, I, uh, they came back with some information that was um, newsworthy to me. I was 39 at the time. I always thought that my name, I had a certain name that, that was in this document here. It's not on this page. Uh, and I always thought my birth date was October 30th, 1972. Well, I could never have told someone when I was two years old what my name was, um, when my birth date was, but I needed that information to have on a passport. And so for 39 or 37 years of my life, I always assumed that my birthday was what was in that passport. Apparently, um, they assigned me a date and the name re reflects the name of the person that ran the, uh, the orphanage. And this is one of the few photos from my childhood. But it was, it was enlightening for me to have that trip and I'm thankful that Jack uh, invited me to go with him. And so hopefully that gives you some background of, of my heritage. I know a little about. Thank you. Oh, you can sit there. You're fine. No. I'm trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for um, telling us a little bit about your your backgrounds, and that was a really great presentation, Jamie. So thank you very much uh, for sharing that. And uh, Jack, for getting more information, that's that's even better. So thank you. Um, so my second question to everybody here today is, um, you know, we are. Um, a, a city library because we are an independent library district, but we do serve the needs of uh, history and his, uh, historical work in the San Antonio Pass. So, um, in conjunction with other groups and other things, uh, you know, we try to like to you know broadcast what brought everyone to this general region because unless you're part of our First, Na First Nations peoples, uh, some of our uh, tribal friends and family that are here, um, if you're not one of those groups, you come from somewhere else. So. Uh, which includes me as well. I came from LA area. So anyways, what brought you to the San Gronio Pass, either to work here, live here, or uh, sometimes play here to, you know, enjoy our, our lovely mountains and our different other places like that. So we'll start with Betty and keep going around the, the panel. I was born on the island of Kauai, which is about 100 miles from Honolulu. And when December 7th, 1941, when the war started, uh, we were at home, it was a Sunday morning, and we heard the bad news, and a hundred miles sounds like a long distance to a tiny seven-year-old, but I found out it was quite close when it came to uh, matters such as where the soldiers would be stationed. Now, Honolulu, which is on the island of Oahu, has fields or uh, barracks for uh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines. But in World War II in 1941, there were no barracks on the island of Kauai for soldiers, sailors, Marines. Therefore, suddenly, within I would say about a month, more or less, a group came from New York City, if you can imagine, to the tropical areas of Kauai. And they were told, here are your tents, set them up wherever you can find a space. Now I was seven years old, so I didn't realize that that is how the soldiers had been assigned to where they were going to live. Somehow I had seen movies where people were in barracks and you know, they marched in orderly fashion. So that is what I expected. But suddenly in our neighbor's yard and the neighbor who was a dentist had a huge set of bamboos growing in his backyard. Suddenly a lot of soldiers decided hiding under bamboo growth would be a safe place to be. So a bunch of them put their tents up in the backyard of our neighbor, a Korean dentist who had the dense growth of uh, bamboo. There were others who found fields where there were trees they could hide under. And uh, some people were left to uh, almost be in areas which were quite open because they had gotten there late and that's all that was left. Constantly as we walked to school every day, school day, uh, we walked about three miles to Koloa School we would encounter vehicles which were 
army vehicles, jeeps, trucks, even uh, big tanks which rolled past our house and certainly did a great deal of damage to the roads. We were also told we had to carry our own gas masks, which were not very tiny, they were very large, and they always slapped on the side of your thigh as you were walking, but you had to carry it with you every day. And at times, uh, I suppose it was a certain time of the month, a building would be set up where gas would be, tear gas would be um, <clears throat> thrown in and we were to wear our masks and march around in a circle. That way a soldier who was assigned would look into the mask where you could see the child's eyes. And if the eyes were watering, it meant that the mask was leaking. Mm. And for some reason, I always had a leaky mask. So <laughs> I was crying <laughs> all the time that I, I was being tested. We also had to buy <clears throat> war bonds and we pasted uh, little stamps in little, uh, almost like the green stamps that people used to have here. And <clears throat> we were told to save certain kinds of things for the uh, cause of the war. Now, I was totally unaware that Kauai, you know, I was thinking of the United States Constitution, you shall not have soldiers quartered in your house, going back to the old revolutionary period. But of course, that was a difficult thing because there were no barracks. So they had to be quartered somewhere. So that's why the soldiers were each given a tent and they had to do the best they could as to finding a place to place their tent. We had various medical things that we had to have done. Tetanus shots, you had to be blood typed. And I found out I was the only O in my large family of six children, two parents, uh, cousins, four cousins who came to live with us because their father had passed away. And therefore I became a universal donor in case someone happened to need blood. The rest of my family were all blood type B. And I tried to determine and I haven't worked very hard at it, but out of curiosity, why out of, you know, perhaps about 15 people that I was the only one with type O blood and the rest were B. And of course, that's medically possible, but I was just curious. We had to have tetanus shots and other kinds of uh, shots to in case certain things occurred to us. Now, life was very uh, regimented because when you went home and it became dark, your house had to be completely devoid of any light, even a little peep of light passing through the windows. It meant the mothers had to immediately buy uh, very heavy drapery. But in my mother's case, she bought very heavy denim, yards and yards of denim, because we had a house which had French doors and all types of windows, and every bit of window had to be covered. Now, to make a check on it, air raid war wardens came around every evening, and they looked around to see whether light was peeping out from your curtains. Hmm. And if, if they saw any lights, you were reminded to cover it up or you know buy new curtains or whatever you had to do. Now, uh, school went on as usual. We were urged to buy stamps and war bonds. Every now and then we'd see uh, tanks going past our houses. There were a lot of trucks and military equipment. And my brother told me one time that an old uh, gas station close to our house, within a block of our house, he looked in the window, and of course, it was no longer a civilian gas station. 
And he said to me, Betty, did you ever look in that window? I said, no, I'm not that curious. He said, it's full of army rifles. <laughs> so all kinds of things were available if a person were, you know, a rascal and wanted, I suppose, <laughs> to sneak in and um, do some harm or see what was in the buildings. And how did you come to the pass, the pass area? <laughs> I have, uh, when I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Redmond, and there's a connection to a church. I happened to attend a Baptist church to which uh, many of the Hawaiians and part Hawaiians went. It was in Koloa, Kauai, and there was a large group on the island of Oahu in Honolulu that had uh, relations to University of Redlands because people from that Honolulu area had gone to the University of Redlands. At the beginning of the uh, university, it was a Baptist related school. It meant that uh, many Baptists went there, but you didn't have to belong to a Baptist church or to any church to get in there. But I happened to be attending a Hawaiian Baptist church and therefore, I became eligible to try for a, a scholarship to University of Redlands. I got one, so I decided I would go. And that's how I landed in on the mainland. Very good. Thank you. And, wow. Uh, yeah, it's that absolutely incredible. incredible. And how about you? Ooh. Oh, can I just pick up after I came to this country in 1974? Sure. Tell us how that happened. Ah, okay. I got on the plane. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we landed in LAX. Okay. <laughs> and it was uh, December, sec uh, the first week of December. So the whole city was lit up, you know, holiday. And I had never seen something like that in my life. Anyway, it was interesting. Um, my parent in law lived in Costa Mesa. So we stayed with them for a few months. And the only people that I spoke to at the time were my husband's family members. They came to look at me and, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know how to respond to much. So I tend to smile a lot. Anyway, um, so we stayed there a few months when my husband, Michael, uh, tried to get a job. And we can move out. Um, he because he had an agricultural degree from San Luis Obispo, so he had a job with National Farmer Organization, the office in Raleigh. <laughs> and I heard of another town in Raleigh or desert. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to look for the house, but of course it was just the car that he, his dad gave us. The, uh, Chevrolet Impala, I remember that, and it was brown, uh, <laughs> leather seat, or plastic, I don't know, it's hot, um, four doors, no air conditioning, so we drove to <laughs> Raleigh, and I think it was just, we all well done by that time, and we can buy a house to rent, and on the way home, we saw this nice green, place along the freeway, along I-10. I said, oh, let's stop there. That was Beaumont. And there was a house for rent. So we stopped in 6th Street. The house. We went to the house. At the time, 6th Street was just lovely. Lots of eucalyptus grows and elm trees and everything. I didn't know how to drive. So I got a bike with a baby seat in the back, and which that's what I did all those times riding bike with Mickey, and um, in the morning, we rode, rode bike all around and came home and watched Sesame Street. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our life for many years when Michael went to work in Raleigh. He, he came home only weekend. Um, and then we got a, bought a house, a house in the east side of town on Upper School, uh, on, on Evan Street, uh, Evan Street, East Evan the last street in Bend. And um, 
So we live in that house because the house close by public school. And Mickey's going to go to kindergarten. Mickey's your daughter. My daughter. Her name is Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> ah, she, she doesn't like to be called Mickey, but go from there. <laughs> um, anyway, so we moved to that house, and she went to kindergarten school. And I went to volunteer in the classroom three, three mornings a week. Um, got a job as teacher's aide at Central School. Learn how to drive it without hitting a fence. Um, and try to get the credential, teaching credential from Cal State San Marino. And when Mickey moved to first grade, second grade, we got another house. We did to another house. This last one, the one I live now, in West Oakland. And I worked at Hamelin for 20 years. And that, that's that. It was lovely. It's wonderful. All these lovely people. Not many, many Asian face when I went to Hamelin at the time. But later on, the Wong and the Lao family moved in. And it it was lovely to talk to their parents because they can speak Thai and Lao. And I was so homesick for my own language. So that's my, I, I still have, have friends from those group of the family. And they still consider me one of their own, which is great. That's what I have in town, in Bailey. That's great. Yeah. 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 So I went to, when I went up to the University of Redlands after graduating with a degree of um, a degree in English and writing, it took a couple of years, but I got a job at the Redlands Daily Facts, and I worked there for a decade. And then um, about that time, uh, the, the the world of journalism was starting its collapse, and the first wave of of people being shed, uh, I was among them, and. I got a call from uh, Toby Bush, who was the uh, publisher at the time at the Record Gazette in Banning, and he offered me a job out, out here. And I thought, I could hang out for something better. And besides, what's in Banning? I mean, you know, when you grow up in a privileged area like Redlands, Banning's not on your radar. So I, I was reluctant to come out here. And after a few months, when I realized, well, no one's offering jobs like that anymore, I finally came out here and um, became one of the two writers that they had at the paper. We uh, reduced that down to one at the beginning of COVID. But I have tried to get myself involved out here uh, as part of the Historical Society and um, a few of the service clubs out here. And that is, uh, I am the face of the newspaper apparently. So here I am. Very good. So uh, picks up on our first general trend, which is we've all, unless you're from one of our tribes here, we've all come from somewhere else. So. Um, from the perspective of uh, celebrating API heritage this month, um, what does that mean to you to be from your own cultural background? Just briefly, we'll go around again. I don't know much, <clears throat> excuse me, about my grandparents, and I believe they came from Japan or by ship around 1890s. However, I'm not sure. And there was no way as a child that I could do any research on it. As a grown up, I did go to Honolulu and go to the uh, depository that had information about workers who had worked from foreign countries for the sugarcane companies. But it turned out my family had worked for a company that I believe had either refused or had not given the central uh, depository any information about its workers. So they told me, go back to your island and try and find <laughs> out as much as you can. My brother has, has taken photos of areas where camp two, which was the number of the camp uh, at which my grandparents lived in Makaweli, Kauai, uh, is stationed, and I think we have a brief idea of the general area. However, because of many houses being built in the area, 
and you know roads being built and so on it's very difficult to tell whether we're actually looking at the exact spot uh, i'm sure if we did more if i did more research we could find out uh, <clears throat> i i like kawaii i love living there and i hope i can get back there pretty soon after all this COVID is over because the family home in which we had lived for so many years was is an old home it's over 100 years old it's made out of wood but it has housed all of us there were my parents my grandparents six children my parents took in four really rowdy nephews <laughs> who did some really terrible things. <clears throat> For example, they didn't know how to drive a car because they were, you know, like 15 years old or 16 years old, but that didn't stop them from actually starting the car and taking us with them to a very wild ride without the permission of my parents. <clears throat> also, they did things such as, um, trying to make donuts, which they had no idea what to do. However, we who were, you know, innocent stand, standing by people were very, uh, were certainly not reluctant to taste the uh, donuts they had made, mainly because it was made out of lots of sugar, which we rarely received. Uh, during the war, since Hawaii is a very small area, there are not too many places where milk and milk cows can be raised and watched. So milk was a premium. So most of us had canned milk, if we had milk at all. And uh, food from the mainland, of course, was very difficult to get in a war. And the food had to go first to the armed forces. So there were things such as meat, which uh, you know, you need a lot of land to have beef grown. And so we had very little meat, we had canned material, but most um, families, including mine, raised, had huge gardens in which they, we raised all kinds of uh, vegetables. We raised chickens. We tried rabbits, but um, when you look into the eyes of a poor bunny, you're not <laughs> about to eat it. And uh, we did as, as much of our own growing as we could. Fortunately, my father is very good in um, with plants. So we had about four different kinds of avocado trees, which gave us thousands of pounds of avocados, so much that we shared with all our neighbors. We had lychee, we had long gun, we had what is called soursop. Mm -hmm. We had uh, grapes, which I didn't realize my grandfather was growing because during the prohibition periods, he wanted uh, a little bit of alcoholic beverage. <laughs> and, and I wondered when I uh, was about the, uh, the age of being in high school, I said, hey, Everything is here, not, uh, you know, kind of placed, kind of, uh, including macadamia nut trees and so on, kind of in, in, in not necessarily a straight row or anything. Why is it the grapes are all very nicely tended, you know, and with trellises and so on? And of course, it was because grandfather needed um, grapes for his wine, and uh, you didn't want the grapes to be, you know, not growing yeah. properly. So mm. we learned a lot about that. We had breadfruits, we had mangoes, we had um, all kinds of uh, plants, which some of which I don't even know names to. Many are South American plants I found out. And now I go and buy juices which are made from those plants in the local store and they come from South America or Mexico. And I don't know how my dad got those, but that's what it was. Although my parents drink tea and we drank tea as uh, being Asian, <clears throat> they had 
a coffee tree for my grandmother, who mm. also loved coffee, and my mom and dad also loved coffee. And she would roast the coffee herself and then make, you know, grind it and make coffee, which was a very involved process. But I don't know how she figured it out because she was illiterate. She had never gone to school in Japan or in the United States. So I don't know where she read about. She couldn't have read about anything <coughs> of that processing. And we had also the Chinese fruits called longan and lychee, which we sold at certain times of the year when they were ready to be uh, eaten. <coughs> My parents also grew, for extra money, grew acres of Easter lilies, as you can imagine, <gasps> which in Hawaii were used on Memorial wow. Day, not Easter. But they had the plants growing in the ground, and they grew so tall and were so beautiful that soldiers used to come in and ask if they could be photographed next to the plants because they'd never seen a field in the ground of Easter lilies. Mm. And they were wow. beautiful. And my dad loved plants. So he, had, he had two greenhouses with anthuriums, orchids, and ferns, and different kinds of flowers. That's beautiful. Right. So, you, so your, your, your heritage means your family to you. Right. right. That's beautiful. That's great. How about you, Sue? Do you want to talk about your, your family, maybe, if that's what that means to you? Yeah, my, my dad's a homegrown person who lived in La Kwan Penong forever. He went to school somewhere else and became a principal in the elementary school. And then from school to school, from any school, it just depends. Then the, my mom, she did not have really high education, so she pushed me to go to school. She thought I have brain. Um, maybe. <laughs> I graduated from high school. school. I'm the only one who went to preparatory school. So, but it was public. That was Thailand, a public school. And that one was a girl's school that one of the king's consort, consort built to train girls to work in the palace. So there's only 50 students ex admitted each year to go in there. Um, even though it's public school, we still have to have a really stiff entrance examination because they wanted only what they were, the only the one. So we got in. So we just went to university too. At the time, you have to take a entrance examination. Anyway, all those kind of things. So when I came to this part and got it, got denied, not denied, rejected, then I can apply for job and said, no, we already have that field or we need to walk into some different area instead of special education or um, regular credential, so it, it's that way. No, and talk about being a heritage of something, I, uh, for myself, I never look at myself now as, as different as an Asian person. I just see myself as a person, which is not very much. And I see <laughs> other people the same way too. Of course, you, I am aware of their exterior physicality, well, they have to sit down or they have to walk with cane or whatever, then we know that. But other than that, I'm I'm really not interested in other people's heritage much. I just know that if I like them, I like them. Very good. Right, obviously this is uh, uh, different in your experience. So what is what does your background mean to you as as a person? What what would you like to say about that? Uh, well I didn't really have, um, since growing up in an Anglo household, I was not exposed to Asian culture at all, other than um, eating sushi here and there. There, there wasn't a whole <laughs> lot of, of um, upbringing for 
my heritage in Vietnam, and so it was never talked about. I never really identified specifically as Asian unless I had to check it off on a box somewhere. It was never, never uh, really part of my day-to-day -day experience. I, I don't have a whole lot I can really um, elaborate on. Sure, that's 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 fine. So that uh, kind of leads us to our last question because we're going to try to keep this to an hour. Um, having been um, longtime citizens here in the past, um, being AAPI and recognizing the cultural contributions that so many different cultures have uh, made and given to our area and, and the last um, you know century and a little bit before that, um, what would you like to say is your lasting legacy here on the area from your work or the way that you've interacted with the community? What would you like to say has been your impact as a, as a resident of the past here? Well, in my case, I think the best thing that um, I've done was with a partner who was a teacher at Banning High School, Wu Duby, who taught French, Chinese, and social studies at the high school, and he was proficient in all those classes. He and I decided towards the end of our teaching in, at Banning High School, we loved the students, all of them, but suddenly we realized nobody had ever done a book that covered the Indians who were on Morongo Indian Reservation in Bani. We didn't know how to get started financially because we knew that uh, publishing a book is a very costly process. We first started by doing the you know usual. We go to various banquets for various uh, service groups, thinking that perhaps they may <laughs> say, "Okay, we'll help you financially." You know, publish your book, but that doesn't work because they are doing their best to help other uh, well-deserving causes. So <clears throat> finally, we found out that. Uh, Morongo Indian Reservation had its own publisher and we attached ourselves and they were very, very helpful. The publisher is in Wisconsin and here we are in California, but they worked with us. The books got finished. They were very well received. And in 2013, holy smokes, without our knowing it, we were allowed to be given a national honor by the American Association for State and Local History. The problem was Duty lived in Hilo, Hawaii by then. So I was the one who Duty said, you're, you're closer, so you know, go and accept the uh, honor. <clears throat> I was willing to do that. However, I had never been to the Deep South although I had worked for the United States Department of Justice and so on, because I'm Asian and my husband is white. <laughs> you can't go to the South and stay in any <laughs> motel or whatever. And as you know, historically, Black families had to use a green book so they would know which hotel or motel would accept them. So I said to my son and my daughter, both of whom have law degrees, both of whom are employed by our United States government, what am I going to do? Duty is too far away in Hawaii and he can't afford to just fly over to Alabama. I have never been in Alabama before. What am I going to do? Because I'm going to be by myself in a state which is very much, you know, our state for white people. Well, my son volunteered. He was a federal attorney by then. He still is. He said, mom, I'll go with you. My daughter who has a law degree too and worked there and had a gold medal given to her for work she had done for the uh, United States government. She said, I'll go with you too. And she has a law degree. So I said, okay, I'll be protected by two attorneys. So <laughs> I guess I'll be okay. But we found out since it was a national thing, because the American Association for State and Local History has 
chapters in every state, it was a national meeting. So there were people from other states. So we were not just from Southern, you know, with the Southern states, but we enjoyed it because we got to see, and I took photos of the Baptist church in Alabama in which the five girls, young girls were bombed. Remember the bomb was thrown. No one has ever been found to be guilty of that. You, you can't look at some of the displays that are a result of the bomb bombing without actually crying. And my son made sure I had pictures of myself on the steps of that church. And I think that was one of the most interesting and revealing thing about the history of our country to me. And we went to the displays which showed <clears throat> even one United States Department of Justice, what is the head of the Department of Justice? The, the Attorney General? The, no, no, the, um, of all the, um, the Supreme Court. There was a Supreme Court member who had belonged to the Ku Klux Klan. Okay? That struck me. I mean, we have a country which is, if we read our Constitution correctly, that everyone should be you know, judged just as a person, not by the color of the skin. And here I am, I'm not white, which, you know, that my children are half white and half Asian. What are we going to do if this gets any worse? Are we going to stop, uh, you know, some of the things that were going on at the time? And remember that Alabama was where the bridge, remember the famous bridge where yeah. all the uh, people who were working mm -hmm. for civil rights marched on that bridge? Edmund Pettus Bridge. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and when you think about all the history there, I was happy when we went to, when I went to actually, I was called to go up to the stage to receive the certificate, which showed that we were, you know, the winners of that um, aspect of the history, that there were people from 50 states. Because that is what, our book was about that everybody is equal. Absolutely. We have a copy of the book at the Banning Library in case anybody would like to look at it. It's, uh, I have one. And you have a personal <laughs> copy. That's great. She signed it too. Very good. <laughs> would you like to expand on what you think your legacy is? You're, you've been a teacher for a long time here as well, right? Yes. I have been a teacher for 20 years and um, teacher's aide for two years before that and work, not work, but doing something um, for volunteer in this community for a while. Um, you know, I really don't have any preference what I want people to remember me for or by. I, I think they just remember what they want to believe about me, uh, remember about me. Um, maybe they'll do like me. I remember people from bits and pieces about them that I remember. I, when I pick new flowers from my yard, I think of Carol because I always get to share one with her and make me smile. Um, my teachers, Dr. Byrne, at Cal State, so, you know, he was the one who always teased me. Oh, Ned, you write it with accent, which is just funny. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and um, another friend, Mary, she's loved to debate anything about politics. And we just had fun with that. And so every time I see something or read something or touch something, I think of a person, that particular person. And I kind of think that I would like somebody else to think of me in the way they want. Anything that they see about me. If they're not, that's fine too. There's no 
suggestion or request or anything that's it be do and be kind that's great and then um for you i uh, our, our illustrious reporter i often thought well Reporters ask the questions, but do we ever find out what the reporters are thinking? So <laughs> I was interested in having uh, you, Sir Jamie, be on our panel. So sure uh, you know that? yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? I, I just hope that the work that we've been doing, either at the newspaper, or at the Historical Society, um, with the Knights of the Round Table and the Rotary Clubs and all the other clubs that are in this area, that we've last, uh, left behind a lasting impact that's accurate, uh, that you can look back on fondly and favorably. I'll just leave it there. Absolutely. I think you're great. <laughs> well, I think they're all wonderful. You can't see me. I'm still here. That's my hand. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm up on the side. Um, that is our panel. Those are the questions. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted to have everyone in part with, which is we all experience everything differently, but yet we come together in so many different ways. And because we live here and because we are neighbors within different groups, experiences, and places we all get to know uh, each other. So that's kind of what this uh, serves today to uh, them to share and to get us to know each other as well, a little more deeply uh, than we did before this meeting. So um, would you be open to questions if Bonnie has a, one or two? Definitely. We have like a few minutes. Any, anybody want to ask anything? Would that sure. be okay? <laughs> I'll just for the moment. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so let me, let me see. I'm gonna try to unmute. Folks, if anybody has a question, does anybody have a question? Let's see. Uh, okay, I'm going to. Oops. Okay, I know Gay's got one. I'm looking. We should thank you, Francisco, for uh, inviting us. Okay, to I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I, I think yes, everyone can you. unmute. So just um, uh, let's let's not talk over each other if we can. And if you have a question, let's just uh, like Nit said, be kind. Uh, <laughs> let's let's wait till everyone's done, and then we'll ask another question. All right, go ahead, Gay. Um, I'm bringing things up to today and issues that we're dealing with in this nation. I am hoping very much that none of you have experienced any hostility in public by strangers. Um, I, I just, I don't know. So I'm asking. Thank you. <laughs> My, uh... My one of my granddaughters gave me for a as a Christmas present. She gave in my name a Chinese American teacher of first or kinder first grade or kindergarten some lessons. And I thought to myself, you know, at, at Christmas time, I was thinking that was such a wonderful thing for her to do for me. And one of these days, I would like to visit the class. Well, it turned out that COVID and people, it seems, especially recently, picking on Asian Americans to attack for some reason. I thought, well, this is not a very good time to go there, so I'll wait. But I would like to see what the students are doing with that set of lessons, because the teacher was so happy to receive something that she could use. Okay. Can, I, can I tell you something too, Kay? Um, in, in this community, so far, I have not run into anything negative about with, with, with anyone. And uh, maybe I don't go anywhere much. <laughs> <That's the problem. laughs> I'm glad to hear that. No, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, there's a one, one parent stop and ask me, this is the father of the girl that I had in third grade for maybe 15 years now. Hey, Miss Bullen, when are you going to make sushi and share with us again? <laughs> and I just laugh. <laughs> 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 okay, we appreciate the question. It, it was posed to us before the panel, actually, and um, fortunately, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't hear you guys very well at all. Uh -oh. I, I was thanking you for the question and explaining that uh, fortunately, we have not. I have not firsthand had any uh, experience out here in the past area. 
either quit my job or just being here. I really uh, to those types of attacks. And that is very good news. <laughs> we'll knock that. <laughs> yeah, very good news. It's I just asked because a uh, Nit knows this. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Chinese American friend in Oregon, has been accosted several times in public, and she lives in a small community on the Oregon coast. So it's not like she's in a city urban or anything. It's um, so I'm glad to hear that you guys are rolling along as usual. Good. Thank you for the question. Anyone else, uh, please uh, shake your hand or uh, you know, lift a, <laughs> give a gesture if you have a question, uh, looking at Nick or Linda. And then I know there was Jack and Michelle is on. Jack is saying no, okay. Anything else? Uh, Nick, you, you have a question? Hi, Betty and Nick and David. Thank you for sharing today. And I don't have much of a question and just want to thank you for sharing your stories, your individual stories, and knowing that this, and also participating in this event to give and shed light on your individual uh, uh, place and time here, your existence here, and knowing that there's a little community that's uh, starting to have these kind of conversations in, in our, in the past, in the San Bernal Pass area. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Well, thank you, uh, Francisco, for, for putting this panel together and uh, having this, sharing your Sunday afternoon <laughs> on this Memorial Day weekend. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I have, I. Yes, Jack. I have a question. Are we in Betty's house? Yes. For this event, she's been gracious. Uh, uh, Open her house to us. Okay. Would you like a tour? Well, it's very clean. It's very clean, and very neat, and very good pictures. <laughs> this was your husband's studio, right, Betty? Yes, part of it. Not, yeah. Thank you. Including Thank you for noticing that. <laughs> We're surrounded by his. Uh, his life achievements, uh, beautiful, paintings. beautiful paintings of uh, Oakland, the West, uh, New York, some uh, mountains as well. And also a, a nice photo of uh, the, you know, uh, the late uh, Hugh Hauser, which is my idol, because I do love how uh, uh, I got inspired to do some of these oral histories because he was the master of getting impromptu um nuggets of just real life and real sentiments no matter where he was and he was kind of a big kid so i i grew up watching hill house or on local uh, kvcr and i thought wow that would be really a great thing to do one day so um i'm trying to i'm trying to embody his spirit a little bit with these oral histories uh, i'm not as comfortable as he is maybe but uh, <laughs> uh he is he's my idol in that sense i also have a photo here of my husband with tommy kono who was a great bodybuilder and was show a, us would you show a, us a u.s weightlifter and arnold schwarzenegger came to <laughs> our country because he was very enamored of the fact that tommy was not just a bodybuilder but a, a weightlifter but also a bodybuilder and Uh, I have photos of my husband and some of his uh, colleagues who were painters in the East and so on. Yeah, we're surrounded by wonderful things. At Betty's home in Cherry Valley. Thank yes. you. Yes, Cherry Valley. I misspoke. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like that's um, the end of our questions. Uh, thank you all for sharing part of your Sunday with us. I uh, hope you have a great Memorial Day weekend. And uh, thank you again to, uh, I call him Sir Jamie because we're Knights of the Round Table. So Jamie, thank you. Nit, thank you very much. And Betty, thank you very much for helping us be a part of this. Yes, very much. Thank you all. We'll see you soon on our next one. All right, thank you. I have some refreshments. Whoa. We have a few sure. minutes. Yeah. Well, what do you want your chair? Oh, oh you can.